I'll use, you know what, I could I could move that one over to my shop, I guess, and get it. That's what I was just going to say. That's your domestic hot water for your shop. Yeah. I'll have to investigate. That's great. See, I'm, see, I'm supposed to be, uh, am I supposed to be learning that much on this? Should I be contributing yeah. more than I learn? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, a regular discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Technical Editor Mark Peterson. Hello. Fine Home Building Executive Editor Samantha Maver. Hello. And our Senior Editor Jeff Rose. Hi there. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is so cool to be with you all this morning. Thanks for being here. Yeah, good morning. Mm -hmm. Good to see you guys. Good morning. So uh, before we even get started, I want to plug today's after show because honestly, you guys are going to think it's really weird, but I am super excited about it. Today, we're going to talk about drywall, and this was motivated <laughs> in part by two things. One was fixing my own bad drywall this past weekend and Samantha's ongoing struggle with a couple of holes in one of her home's bedrooms. So we're going to talk about the materials and methods to make drywall better, uh, some of the tips I've learned in the decades I've been doing this. Mark and I were talking ahead of the show, and uh, this is some of Fine Home Building's uh, most popular content. And when Mark worked at Family Handyman, he told me that that was the second feature he worked on there, and I'm <laughs> yep. sure it was also popular there. So It was. Um, stay tuned for that, because I sounds weird. You're going to love it. <laughs> You were skeptical nothing, yesterday, am I right, Samantha? Sexier. You were like, what? I was skeptical only that everyone wanted to go even more in depth, but I think, you know, I often find that the things I want to know more about, lots of people want to know more about, so yeah. I'm not skeptical anymore. <laughs> nothing sexier Mark. than drywall, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I described it as uh, construction's unsung hero, which I think is uh, a wow. fair, fair description. Okay, we got to wait. Anyway, so you, are you still working on your house, Mark? Is this like a, a, a going to be a years long saga or are you at a spot where it's pretty done and you're happy with it? No, I'm, it's an ongoing process. So it's my, it's my second half, uh, part-time job every day. So <laughs> I've got a list of things. It's get the list is getting smaller, which is great, but, um, I just finished a little deck for my mother-in-law, um, my mother-in-law suite off her back patio. And that was a fun little project, but you know, it's, it's one of those little projects that, well, PVC, any kind of maintenance free decking is not cheap and, you know, railing systems and that sort of thing. But so yeah, there's, it's kind of works out nice because I've got putsy little things I can do when money is low and save up some money for the bigger project. So after the deck, I mean, when I put up before the cider showed up, I put up PVC J blocks for all the outlets and lights, and and I literally just cut a size uh, PV three quarter inch PVC board and put them up there. And you know what? They look kind of crappy, <laughs> so I'm gonna go back. Because they're and, too thin. Yeah, there's sometimes the siding is like flush with them, sometimes it's not. So I'm gonna go around and my next little project, and I have all the PVC, so it's a nice one to do. It doesn't cost much, but I'm gonna go around and kind of picture frame them in with some PVC trim, which will be pretty easy and time consuming and relatively inexpensive. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, do you feel like there's a point at which you'll be done with this work or will this just be ongoing? Cause you'll just oh, keep. Yeah. What kind of question is that? We got a letter from someone who listened to the podcast talking about the story you told about building your house and they ended by saying, you know, it'll all be done someday. And I thought, will it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but the big, I mean, for me, the big stuff, you know, so I still have to build a pergola off the back, but I'm going to wait for the ground to settle. I have to do some pretty major patios in the back and then the front uh, sidewalk and apron I still have to pour. So those are the big ones I have left. So when those are done, Samantha, I would say yes. But then I've got the looming project. I've got a foundation right next to the house that has no shop sitting on it. So that's kind of the big looming thing. You got a new project. You yeah, can call that well, a new one. A thousand new ones. Yeah, exactly. But I'm no, there's never Jeff any shortage. To weigh on this in on this too, but what I observe is when 
by the time I finish, like it's time to redo some of the stuff I did uh, years ago. And just nodding, yeah, yeah, it's like it's yeah, it's like like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. It's like they start at one end, <laughs> and by the time they're at the other end, they start over again. Yeah, is that how it works? Makes uh -huh. sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't think my kids. So I two of my well, they're all in houses, but two of them are homeowners, and I don't think that either one of them realized how much stuff I did over the last, over their <laughs> lifetime. They're like, oh God, I gotta fix this and do this and tweak that and my door doesn't work and my water heater's acting up and I got water in my, yeah. it's like, it, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, and if you don't know how to do it, you need to have a handy person who knows. Right. <laughs> And you have to have the money and motivation, which is no yeah. small thing, right? And when you have little kids, especially, uh, there's a lot, of, not a lot of time for home improvement projects, and making a mess of the house or making it dangerous is still another problem. So it's yeah, like, but you know, you got to go by what's most like dangerous and health important, right? If you know mm -hmm. about it, like we just went to this building science symposium where we heard one of the presentations, I forget which one exactly, but the subject had something to do with air sealing, probably because the discussion was about how much like water could diffuse through drywall and the difference between whether the drywall was air sealed and if there was like a hole in the drywall. And I don't remember the exact figure, but how much water was like getting into your walls. And that's why I've thought you know, I now need to fix this drywall hole immediately. It's not just a cosmetic project <laughs> like I initially right. thought. Let's get going. Even if you put tape on it, uh, exactly. will help with the the. Uh, so what the, the the conversation was about control layers and specifically air barriers, and mm -hmm. they were talking about the triage of control layers. You first want to deal with bulk water, second is air. And the point is that if you have a hole in your air barrier, the movement of air through it is going to carry a lot of water on it and deposit it on the coldest thing wherever that air ends up. And it's probably not something you want happening, right, Sam? Yeah, and we talked to somebody who specializes in like mold um, mitigation and and uh, inspection, and she was just talking about how like the description of water as vapor has she didn't phrase it this way, but has potentially confused some people into thinking that it's not water that's getting into their walls, but that's exactly what it is. If you get rid of bulk water, then you have this vapor that you still have to manage. And so she's like, people don't realize this is what's happening to them. It's very poorly understood still. And, and when people talk about improving the thermal performance of their homes, the thing they always say is, we need more insulation. Uh, <laughs> we need more insulation. Right. And uh, without a good air barrier, insulation does very little. Yeah, right. all those are those R ratings that you see on the bats of insulation. Those, you know, they gain those ratings by testing it in, you know, a very specific, very controlled, a very non-air. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, in a box. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, well, I've started experimenting with um, LED low voltage lighting. Uh, you know. I've done a lot of electrical work in the years, and uh, I recently bought a uh, driver and a bunch of LED strip tape, and uh, I'm having a great bunch of fun experimenting with that. My plan is to put like a valence at the top of my wall here in front of me um, to reflect light off the ceiling, and... Uh, which brings me to the drywall finishing. When I did a mock-up of this, I actually took my four-foot tube fluorescent fixtures and turned them upside down and put them on some temporary cribbing to see how this would work. And the raking light uh, revealed my very badly finished drywall from a decade <laughs> before, and it just really made me sad. So I had to fix it. And this very small project, this very... Uh, uh, kind of ideation uh, process led to hours of drywall finishing. So I feel like I have a new appreciation for your dilemma, Samantha. That's so interesting that you're doing these things with light that are like recommended to just have like this better visibility and like a softer glow. And then you're just illuminating more parts of your house that you need. <laughs> right. <laughs> that I didn't yeah. want to see. <laughs> you know, Patrick, I did for the first time. I mean, I've done some pucks and other things, but for the first time on my place in the mother in the house, I did the under cabinet lighting where you buy the little, you know, the little power control things and the strips and you got to figure out how many watts you need for each length of strip and how to connect them to each other. And it was a fun little, it was actually a fun little project. And it, it, it was, I thought so too. 
Yeah. It reminded it just, me of Legos, Mark. Right? You know what? It reminded uh, yeah. me of a kid yeah. with a yeah, yeah. El- erector set or a little electrical, you know, science lab type thing. But one thing <laughs> well, I learned, the one thing I learned was those little connectors that connect one strip to another are terrible. And I'm I got glad it. I bought two dozen of them. And they came no, to me. I know. It. <laughs> you know, and, and when I here, it, honestly, honestly the, the company that I bought my strips from, they I watched, you know, you watch their videos. How do they do this? Even in their own videos, and they're the people who are making or selling the stuff, they're like, yeah, these uh, friction fit connectors really suck. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, compared to, you know, it's like, well, whatever you can do it, you can, you got to solder it. And that was my lesson learned. I, you know what? I would solder next time because you get it all set up and you kind of test as you go when you can. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, I got a flickery light or one, you know, one in the section's not working and... It for the extra amount of time to solder, I would recommend doing it. And I just thought it was funny that they were ripping on their own products and yeah, these things suck. <laughs> I am really glad we had this conversation because I was wholly going to rely on those little plastic connectors. And I kind of looked at them like, eh, these are kind of cheesy. Uh, yeah. And they are, I guess, huh? And then you got to, there's other things like the width of the strip. It's like 0.8 millimeters. Some strips are, so the connectors have to be the same size. Otherwise they won't work. And yeah, there's there was a little more to, it seemed like, not enough people are taking advantage of, and I enjoyed it, so I'm not complaining, but it was kind of fun. But it seems like there was, there just wasn't a good method where you could just say, all right, here's what I have. This, These are the parts that you need for this scenario. It just didn't seem like anybody was really doing that very well. Well, and you summed up what I think fine home building needs to do, which is have a feature article on this very subject and, and show folks the nuts and bolts of the systems and reliable connections, because I am sure there is a lot of this stuff that is malfunctioning out there. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've done some stuff on, on LED strip tape and how beautiful it is in different applications, but not so much on logistical installation. Yeah. It sounds like yeah. there's some key features to know about. So finish and, this project, Patrick, and then let's do something like that. And then I would the other someone thing, who knows more about it than me to write it, but sure. I, I think I can. See what else you come up against. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll have some questions for sure that need and, answered. Yeah. And the other, the, the other piece of advice that I learned, and luckily I didn't learn it the hard way, but, hard way, but once you get all these strips together to put them up in place like you did it sounds like to see what they look like before you just start sticking stuff underneath the cabinet because my cabinets have kind of an extended skirt underneath so had I put them where most people put them it would have just left a big shadow so I kind of had to hold them up there told me that he found the same thing after a trial yeah he had to move his tape after installing it yeah yeah okay there's a lot here Jeff have you used any of this stuff not the not the tape no uh, I've just used little, It's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's relatively inexpensive. It's super cheap. I think I spent like 100 bucks for all the stuff I bought. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. My brother did this with LED strip tape around his room and in different colors. I, I don't think any of this would be recommended for fine home building, but... Well, fine, Liam I, did, I, too. Really it's pretty it. fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you know, as always, we heard from our uh, amazing listeners, and I thank you all for when you write in your questions, comments. I really, really do appreciate it. Uh, this one starts out, hi, FHB crew. I just finished, ep- finished episode 575 and wanted to chime in on the last segment about venting stoves. Ian didn't like the New York Times article, and I understood his point that we should be comparing against the pollution ed- emitted by non-combusting appliances. Lucky for us, that research is emerging. What he's saying is we should be comparing the pollutants coming from an induction or, uh, you know, uh, conduction or uh, con- what is what is the other kind? Induction or conduction, uh, electric range versus a gas range, right? Mm-hmm. And he says, luckily, that research is emerging. Here's an NPR story summarizing a recent study which sought to measure whether benzene emissions came from the combustion heat source or from the food being cooked. Researchers also tested whether cooking food, pan frying salmon or bacon emits benzene, but found all the pollution came from the gas and not the food. That's important because the gas industry often deflects concern about pollution from its fuel to breathing problems that can be triggered by cooking fumes. So basically they made dinner on combustion stoves and induction stoves and only the combustion uh, stoves emitted benzene. The researchers also looked into whether hood fans meaningfully vent the benzene 
I screenshotted some of the data below. My takeaway is that ventilation reduced the benzene, but house one was over the threshold whether or not ventilation was on, and house four was below the threshold whether or not ventilation was on. So for these two houses, ventilation wasn't a difference maker. Love the show. Hope it helps. My guess is that the ventilation strategy worked in one home and not in the other. Uh, and Wait, you know, it seems like if you had a good ventilation system, it, I, don't, I guess I don't understand why that wouldn't work. Is is the the person saying that the gas stoves that is con, that's conduction? Have uh, gas stoves are just gas stoves that would be a, the you know, electric open flame. stoves are conduction versus induction, right? And so the conduction is creating this gas that's not being created by the no so the gas stoves are creating the benzene whether or not there's food being cooked uh or you know the food was food was not producing benzene in the induction uh versions of the test but the induction versus conduction but neither of those were producing it so it's it's the gas stoves that are guilty of producing this that's what we can take away according to brian and this uh npr story I find it more interesting because of like, I mean, maybe this is old news now that chefs prefer gas cooking for this fine dining style of, you know, like you're a, you're a fine chef, but I think a lot of them are moving to induction now that it's like such an interesting technology, um, from the cooking shows that I watch. (laughs) I know this to be the case. (laughs) Do you have an induction, uh, top or we had a countertop one. I don't, and I thought I did, but it turns out what I have is like a rapid boiling effect on a just a regular convection electric stove. Conduction, yeah. Yeah, conduction. That's what I have too, yeah. Yeah, so the, I, I thought it was a similar thing, but it's not. It's actually just pumping more electricity. But we are writing an article that's going to come out in the next issue about induction cooktops that explain the way that science works. It's It's much more interesting than I thought it was having to do with the actual surface not heating up. But the so reaction weird. with the pan <laughs> yeah. was creating it's, creating it's the just, heat, and so. it's bizarre how it's almost like magical how fast you can boil water on one yeah. of those cooktops. So maybe it's just the, so all the time is like that's the big virtue. Uh, yeah. Aside from the lack of pollution. Yeah. Well, we just shop, well, yeah. We just shop for stoves, and it, I I I would have thought that it would have been a much bigger thing. But you know, when you're looking at stove models, sure they're out there, but it's not you know it's not like half half and half i mean they're still pretty rare when it comes i to wonder the it just needs to become more ubiquitous because you do need special pots and pans they i think that has a lot to do with it. but i think this is the way people will be going especially with this information about gas stoves i mean i've known yeah, that, that could air be. quality is a concern and it's not a, the same concern with electric versus induction like conduction versus induction but if you're going to choose one over the other, it sounds like induction gives you some benefits in terms of cooking time yeah. and quality of cooking that gas gave you as well. Yeah, I don't know you about know, the control side, but it's the speed side. The speed side, it's you know unsurpassed as far as I know. I think a, a part of this, this is largely not talked about, is people use what they know. No one likes to relearn how to cook. <laughs> and if you're used to cooking on a gas range, yeah. That's what you're going to want to do. Just like folks who learn how to do whatever building process a certain way and a new technology comes along, they're often very resistant to change uh, unless it can be demonstrated that it is definitively faster, better, whatever. Uh, if if there's not a perceived benefit, everyone is resistant who is used to a certain technology. Mm. Yes, 100%. We're all guilty um, of that. I think that's human nature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try to get a kid to change their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> the age old battle. <laughs> this comes from uh, YouTube Francis. Uh, YouTube Francis was talking about our ongoing conversation about power tool batteries and their complexity and their uh, sole platform nature. And he writes, uh, there are only two pins on every bat- tool battery I've seen. These two pins are DC and no communication. Only the charger has more two pins. Uh, that's just not true. <laughs> I took pictures of three of my different battery packs and three different manufacturers, and they all have communication terminals between the uh, hot and uh, neutral side of the battery. So uh, not true. Um, That's an easy one to deal with here. Doug from Colorado (laughs) writes, hi, all. I enjoyed Mark's tale of building his new house. 
uh, the 571 after show. Anyone who's gone through the process of doing your own building can relate. I was dismayed at the material cost he experienced. In the summer of 2010, when I was ready to sheathe my roof, I was upset because 5 8 inch OSB had jumped to $13 a sheet, <laughs> <laughs> which seems like quite the bargain now. Having yeah. moved in long before the house was finished, I would say to Mark, it will all be done someday. Right. Uh, <laughs> That's just what he said. That's the one I was talking about. Uh, yeah. I looked for uh, my own curiosity what uh, 5 8 inch inch five eighths inch osb costs and uh, you can't buy it it's 1930 seconds uh which is something that the mills have done in recent decades right isn't that funny and i'm guessing it's because they got sued by somebody who was mad because they were missing a 30 second of an inch on their osb thickness but anyway that was just about 20 bucks for a sheet so yeah and FYI. i think uh, yeah your standard seven seven did you say seven sixteenths so this is five eighths yeah, seven sixteenths yeah. is back down. You know, I think in the neighborhood of ten bucks a sheet. So it's. 400. Are you feeling like you should stockpile it for your workshop? <laughs> <laughs> I actually did. I just like yesterday thinking, how long would it sit out there if I had you know a tarp over it? Would it start to sweat? Or I was literally thinking of that exact same thing. <laughs> Yeah, so 2010 is about when I built this building that I'm sitting in, and I remember that this the uh, prices were creeping up. And boy, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a normal person, when you see stuff going up two, three bucks a sheet, you're like, "Well, that's not anything I had planned on, uh, right?" And, well, I was still building houses in the 2008. Well, we were doing what we could after the 2008, but in that we were, I was still as a you know licensed contractor back then, and. My, we got mail back then, believe it or not, regular mail in the mailbox. <laughs> and I would say like three out of four envelopes that I got were our suppliers saying, oh, roofing just went up another 20% or, oh, this went up 10% or, oh, this went up, you know, and you start adding on 10% to something that cost 10% more the last time and it starts adding up very fast, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of that, a lot of the petroleum products back then, you're plastics and your roofing asphalt roofing and those things were just and they said oh it's going to come down after the you know the, the price of oil comes down and yeah not really <laughs> not really and i've read recently that uh you know manufacturers have gotten used to higher margins on stuff and uh, I, I don't see that like them wanting to give that back who would Right. Sticky. I, I, one of the few things I remember from uh, college year one, Econ 101, is sticky down, where prices go up fast, but then they're very slow and sticky to come back down to where they were before. Is it this climate or just the case in general that, like you said, when you need someone to come for like a specific sub trade, they might say like, oh yeah, I'll be there in three weeks. And then that's, <laughs> they're just not going to show up if it's three weeks. Is that always, or is that like, cause I told some friends who are hoping to do some renovations that if they get any three week quotes, right. that maybe move on. <laughs> I mean, I was a small sample size, but, uh, I, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's been certainly been my experience. I mean, with more demand for building, it would make sense. Although things are starting to slow down. I've talked to, That's you know, true. every time I talk to a contractor, whether it's over a story or I'm on site for shoot or whatever, you know, I always ask them, how's it going? How's it, you know, what, what's the, uh, you know, are you as busy as you were last year and that sort of thing. So it's always been busier than ever. Up until recently, I've talked to a few contractors that they say, we were, you know, we're swamped right now, but I'm not bidding on things for three months from now. So have you heard anything like that, Patrick? I've heard a mixed bag, Mark. I did hear that at first, especially I'm part of a, um, a Facebook group of builders. And uh, they were saying that, especially in uh, Southern Connecticut. But then we were at the recent ah. built, uh, building science symposium in, uh, in Southern Connecticut, and uh, I was hearing the opposite. So uh, yeah. it's a mixed bag. I'm, yeah. I am really surprised at the high interest rates haven't affected it more. I mean, I mean, honestly, I'm shocked because what what is the mortgage interest rate right now going for? Is it five or six even? Oh, I was reading seven, I think, in the uh, New York Times yesterday. I mean, if you I take mean, which even, still seems low to me, but... But if you take a $400,000 house... 3.9. Yeah, 2.9. I, I think I'm in the twos as well. It was the, it was the, hot, the hot spot of 2020. Wow. 
But <laughs> if you take a four hundred thousand dollar house and do the math versus you know six percent versus under three percent. You know, it's hundreds of dollars a month that you're spending extra. And that's, you know, that pushes a lot of people out of the market, or I would think. You know, I just spoke to Justin Fink, our old um, editorial director, who may write a story for us. And he was doing, he does a lot of um, restoration work. And he was working on a house and he was working as a general contractor. And he had a whole, whole crew. And he's like, I wouldn't do it again. Just like the number of people that were doing different jobs and not, not hitting this one. So he was, he was still feeling the three week pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it entirely depends on where you're at. Right. I mean, uh, if you're in an affluent area, folks, you know, they don't have mortgages or they have lots of money. It doesn't matter. And they are likely working from home, uh, based on what I've seen, survey data indicates that higher income earners are much more likely to be working from home. And mm -hmm. they probably still have a backlog of stuff they want to do to change their house, to make it more livable is my guess. Yeah. Exactly well, in, 2000, I... in 2008, in the twin cities market, the, you know, the, how the really high end homes, you know, 800,000 plus, it didn't really phase that market at all. I mean, it was like not even a blip, it was just, you know, because they they could afford the the difference in, you know, whatever the, and a lot of those people actually probably benefited from that. You know, a lot of the homeowners because it's a mortgage interest. The mortgage oh, interest. There were so many subcontractors yeah. that were just basically working for free, you know, at the end of the day. <laughs> that uh, yeah, I mean, it worked out well. But because there was those big projects were those expensive projects were the only ones being done. Well, speaking of mold. Uh, Evan Bockwig, who's uh, our friend from All Mold Pro in Dallas, Texas, wrote into the podcast, Hello, FHB team. I really enjoyed your discussion about ventilation. It's a huge topic that's largely misunderstood by homeowners and professionals alike, and I'm struggling to find professionals in the HVAC industry that are both knowledgeable, capable, and willing to help consumers. Me too, Evan. Uh, <laughs> They're, they're so swamped that with regular business that they often don't have the time to dedicate educating and helping consumers over the long term when trying to retrofit ventilation and solve indoor air quality problems. I was talking to a custom home builder friend this week who pulled out his ERV because of humidity issues in his new tightly built house and replaced them with ventilating dehumidifiers to manage the, the humidity in climate zone 3A. We were wondering if our local industry is a bit misguided in promoting ERVs, given how much humidity our houses have to deal with here in Dotless, Fort Worth. It seems to me that ventilating dehumidifiers are the best slash only way to go. What are the problems of going with a ventilation dehumidifier? Is it putting the house under positive pressure than rather than balanced ventilation of an ERV? I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on balanced ventilation with an ERV versus a ventilating dehumidifier for my climate zone and those similar. As an aside, I often talk about the importance of ventilation with my clients, but it's hard to sell the idea to them of a system that is going to cost multiple thousands of dollars when they have no obvious health effects. How should we as, an industry, prof as, as industry professionals talk about ventilation with consumers? Keep up the great show. Well, thanks, Evan. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the first to admit when I'm in over my head, and this is definitely in over my head, but I have heard <laughs> uh, ongoing reports of um, the need for uh, standalone dehumidification systems in homes, especially in warm, humid places. And uh, I think Dallas Fort Worth is definitely among them. Thoughts, folks? Yeah. Boy, that's, it is, you know, it is over, that's over my pay grade as well. However, you know, one thing that stuck, and I give this advice all the time when people say, I can't find, and I had the trouble too. And I had trouble finding somebody who even knew what the hell an ERV was. And they're in the, you know, it's like, we just don't do these things here. And what I've done actually successfully a couple of times, because I'm in a new area where I don't know people. Um, you know what? Instagram or, you know, social media platform like that is not a bad way to go. I mean, if you search for H HVAC on Instagram in your area, you're likely, especially if you're in a big metro, you're likely to pull up some some folks on there. And what's interesting about that is these people who are posting what they're doing on Instagram, they're almost by definition, they they have a more probably more of a passion about it because they're, you know, they're taking extra time to do these things. And you can just see by their posts. It's like they're these people care about what they're doing, they're knowledgeable. And it's it's not a bad way to reach out to folks. And even if they don't you know, they're busy or maybe they're a little bit out of your area, it's likely that they know other 
um, they know other contractors who kind of have the same mindset that, you know, they, they actually give a about what they're doing. And, you know, if you send them out a message, say, hey, you know, you got somebody who is passionate or, you know, as passionate about you, your, you know, this field in my area, it's probably a pretty good chance they'll know somebody. I have um, a couple of questions about the scenario, but one thought that came to mind is that something that could be a good resource, but you'd have to make sure you find someone knowledgeable is somebody who is in the mold investigation or mitigation specialty, because I actually had some mold mitigated in my walls and that person came recommending like a number of different ventilation options for my future. Basically, like these are what we recommend to people, and maybe like that's a good avenue toward. You'd have to have that. This person was very knowledgeable about about mold mitigation and what was happening here, but about de dehumidification and the best manner of doing it in the house that I was in. Um, so that's one one possible option would be like asking a mold remediation special to, specialist. Except Evan is the mold radiation specialist. He's looking for. Oh. Uh, <laughs> he's I didn't read for... this. I didn't get this question. I'm so sorry. He, <laughs> so he's talking about a specific area of the house or the whole house. He's talking about the whole house, and he's talking about his very uh, unforgiving climate with regard to humidity control, right? And my guess is the homes like in Dallas, like in most places, have oversized uh, cooling systems, at least for most of the year. So they need some way to control humidity, especially in a tight house, uh, because if you have a leaky house, your oversized HVAC system is not as big a deal as if it were super tight. And what it's doing is the AC system is satisfying the thermostat uh, before it has a chance to dehumidify the house, mm -hmm. which is why in many cases you need a standalone dehumidifier that's either ducted independently or it's mm -hmm. ducted into the um, ductwork for the uh, air conditioning and heating system. So, and a lot and of times, you, yeah, that scenario, you, that scenario is often uh, caused by oversized, you know, oversized uh, condensers. Systems, condensers, yeah. But, yeah, oversized system because they – they all of a sudden, you, all right, it calls, you know, your house is 74, you said it at 70, and within five minutes, you know, that cold air blasted in, it dropped your house to 70, but it didn't have time to really condition the, the air that was in there. So, well, you know, the, I'm having trouble. Go ahead. Is there some aspect of it that matters how airtight the house is or because the, the question is really whether or not you're going to add a dedica dedicated ventilation because the ERV or the dedicated dehumidification will dehumidify. So the question is like, are you going to add more? So the ERV might not do, do enough according to Evan's right. uh, a case study here, right? It was not doing the job that theoretically it should have done. And, and it's, that's and not its I job. Mean, it's not meant to lower humidity. Again, this is not my area of expertise, but I mean, isn't that what a balance, I mean, regarding the, the, the tightness of the house, isn't that what a balanced ERV, I mean, isn't that what how it deals with? I mean, isn't, shouldn't that be picking that up and, and operating in a way that, you know, is unique to that tightness of that particular house? I mean, isn't that what the balance part of it, the equation means? Yeah, I don't think the balance part is the problem. I think it's that it's just it's meant to exchange humidity, not control it. Uh, so it's, I'm having it's the wrong appliance in my in my crawl space. Never had a crawl space before, so you know we opened up some. So it's a conditioned crawl space, and I just actually had a conversation. My HVAC guy was coming out. Well, I noticed it was really humid. You know, in the uh, this spring and even towards the late winter. And even last fall, it was actually just for the last six months, it's been higher humidity than it should have been. And so I just bought a standard dehumidifier, you know, a cheap dehumidifier, put it down there, ran the toes in the drain and let it go. And it keeps it, I keep it at 50 and that little unit works. However, I just kind of assumed that a lot of that moisture was coming out of the concrete, coming out of the masonry units, you know, underneath, coming out of the whatever building materials, but it still hasn't gotten any better. So he's going to come out and we're going to I think it's because it's cold. It. It's much cooler, right? It's, it's, uh, that's the problem. It doesn't, yeah, so and it's not getting enough. We're going to start with opening up some more, you know, kind of more conditioned, you know, we're going to open up some vents and see if we can get some airflow down there and just condi condition more of that space, so... That, I uh, prefer not to have a humidifier, dehumidifier running all the time. Because of the energy penalty. Well, it just, yeah, it's just, I just don't like having stuff in my house that's just always running. Yeah. <laughs>
One uh, thing I would explore, Evan, uh, is uh, Santa Fe de Dehumidifiers is the leader in this space, and they're the ones who make these ventilating dehumidifiers. Uh, they have very smart people working there. If you have specific questions, I would not hesitate to reach out to them. Nikki Kruger is one of the presenters at the mm -hmm. Building Science Symposium. We saw Samantha. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, they have smart people there who can probably help with these situations. And I'm guessing they have way more case studies to go on what works and what doesn't versus us or anyone else, mm -hmm. especially us. <laughs> <laughs> this comes from, uh, I forget. Uh, hi, podcast team. Over the years, I've seen numerous articles and references on the show to the advantages of using advanced framing techniques. What I wonder about is there are hidden problems or risks hurt, read or heard about in any of the discussions. I started, uh, who, a, for example, putting in a larger window on the second floor changes the load path down to the floor, first floor. My guess is that there are many out there who would make a change like that without consulting, consulting an engineer or investigating how the floor system has been framed. Also, with less framing in the walls and around openings, how are people installing trim, hanging curtain rods for drapes, and anchoring things securely to walls when studs are, are more scarce? 16-inch spacing makes it a challenge enough at times where there might be one stud for a TV wall bracket before you may have only sheetrock uh, in advance of the framed house. Uh, maybe I'm overthinking this and it's not a problem, and I'm not sure it's a problem for me because I live in an old, old house with its own bundle of eccentricities. Um, so is not having more framing members in the wall a problem if you want to hang drapes? And that is the one complaint I've heard from my friend who built a OVE house in, I'm guessing the early eighties or mid eighties, uh, back to the lander, uh, used OVE framing to save resources, save money, use less, uh, material, uh, except he complained that whenever he wanted to hang something up or change something in the house, there was never enough building material to uh, mount it to, which is kind of funny, right? Something that you don't is, think about. Oh, well, yeah. My, my, my initial thought is that this is the type of project that you do need to overthink. Yeah, and absolutely. Plan to yep. the detail. There cannot be a mistaken load path because Correct. this wasn't planned out and you're just doing it. So, yeah, you got to overthink everything. You got to spend more up front and then have really have a, uh, a good architect or home designer to, because yeah. honestly, every single, st and you got to make sure you talk to the framers. It's like, no, you can't start framing on this side of the wall. You got to start on this or whatever. So, all these, I mean, all your floor. Your floor joists are lining up with load carrying, you know, windows, like you said, the Jackson King studs. I mean, those all have to line up. And when you get down to that detail, um, you know, even things like where your toilet flange is going to be, because if, I mean, if it just everything needs to line up, you know, and I learned oh, that with, yeah. Hilariously, we've only spoken to builders, so I don't actually know about if people are finding it difficult to hang. <laughs> and the blocking, you know, if you have a certain type of trim with a taller profile, that's going to be more problematic because, you know, if you got six inch trim or a layered subtype of layered trim, it's, yeah, I mean, you got to really think this out. We're going to have and to do a story is... in an advanced framed house right. <laughs> for this detail. Actually, actually, that was one of the few things I did remember. No, I remember more than a few things, but I did remember to put up blocking for curtain rods because that is... Uh, and then just thinking about, you know, I mean, as people age in home too, and you got to install a, you got to install a grab bar bars in stuff, your toilet. Yeah. It's like that's something I've been wanting to write about. It's just pre-planning a home's blocking so that you can have this availability for anything you need to do in the future: grab bars and bathrooms and showers and things like that. Yeah. Yep. We did that piece, uh, but it's been a long time, uh, even before I started here. I think it was one of Justin's early pieces where he worked with someone to identify all the places where blocking was often overlooked. Handrails is one of them, like for rosettes for handrails and uh, the brackets. Yeah, that and there's, there's even more rail. stuff that's just good for you. Like, I guess we're not talking about blocking when we talk about light, but it's like we used to talk about like future modifications you could make to your house, but there's actually like more stuff you could build in right up front that's just more accessible for anyone who's coming to visit you. Yeah. I wish we had a sound effect for when I get on my soapbox, but if, <laughs> if we had one, uh, it would sound now. And 
In many cases, I think OVE framing is misguided. Uh, it's it's just a pain, and for what benefit? Like when I hear folks about emitting top plates or double top plates, and then custom cutting studs to height, it's like it doesn't make sense. Especially if you're going to use exterior insulation, it just frankly doesn't matter that much. But well, exterior then, insulation is admittedly a rare thing, but. And there's just so many things that are designed for 16. I mean, it just opens up a whole kind of world. You know, your HVAC vents, your, um, you know, things that are just designed to hang in kitchen cabinets. I mean, there's just so many things that are designed for 16 on a side. And not that that's the reason to do, I mean, if, to, to do it the wrong way. Or, but, but like you said, if, if the benefits were that impressive, then yes, there's no reason to do it in a way that's just wasteful. But I'm not convinced that adding an extra, because it's not even halving, it's really, what do you save in 20% of, you know, 20% lumber? I mean, financially, it's not that big of a deal. It's that, you know, your studs aren't that big of an expense, but yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's a lot. Of, and then, you know, your insulation, if you're doing bad insulation, I mean, 20, it's just a pain, everything's just harder. <laughs> I think it makes sense in many instances. I think ladder tees make a lot of sense. I think two stud corners make a lot of sense. I think putting like yep. triple tw two by 12 headers and gable walls makes no sense. Um, mm -hmm. Some things make sense, some things don't. I, I, uh, I like to adopt uh, things I like and ignore some of the other more wacky uh, framing saving techniques. And I think just a well-designed, you know, window place, window and door placement can save a lot of lumber just right there. You know, if every single one of your windows is just lining up wrong, so you got a, you know, you got a stud inch and a half away from a jack stud on every single window right there, you're, you're saving a bunch of lumber. So mm. more plenty. Can you just, work I mean, on exactly the soap block sound effect, Jeff? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what you said, Samantha. It's it's all you got to really, really. If you're going to go that route, really do the work up front. I know all about overthinking, so <laughs> <laughs> I tend to say when it's needed. <laughs> uh, this comes from Ed. Hey, uh, hi, hi, FHB podcast crew. I look forward to your weekly podcast, special podcast, and after show podcast. Thanks for all the invaluable information on residential construction and enhancements. As a retired engineer and now part-time handyman, I enjoy the discussion on a wide variety of topics in your shows. I installed a heat pump water heater last summer when my 35-year-old oil-fired fire, boiler bit the dust, and I, I decided to no longer heat my domestic hot water with a coil in my boiler. Thus far, the experience with a hot water heater has been very positive, especially with the $1,000 instant rebate that defrayed the initial costs. Due to the heat pump water heater, my basement remains quite cool and dry due to the cooling and dehumidification, and I no longer need to run a dehumidifier, at least to this point in the year, in the last week of June in Dutchess County, New York. Do you have any recommendations regarding the ducting of intake and exhaust from the water heater to cool the upstairs of my home in summer? Also, for the winter months, any thoughts and recommendations on regarding ducting schemes? I should mention that for AC, I just use window units and I'm thinking about installing a heat pump or two, but want to learn more about HVAC and make my log home, Patrick's favorite, more energy efficient in order to properly size a heating and cooling solution for my house in the not too distant future. Regards, Ed. Have you all been noticing an HVAC theme? It's been like so recurring in my life. It seems like all the things I talk about are about a heating and air conditioning. And it's one of the things I know least about. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's really, it's one of those things where as a builder or contractor or a small general contractor, you do some wiring and you do some plumbing and you do flooring and framing and drywall and painting. But typically your HVAC is, you're calling somebody. I mean, it's the one, it's really the one trade that most general contractors or even small, even repair folks are calling somebody because Especially nowadays when, I mean, before it's like, oh, I'll just throw a duct over there on an 80%. Nowadays, you can just screw up everything by chopping holes and moving stuff and running ducts where they shouldn't, they don't belong. And um, I just, yeah. I aim to understand the science and heat pump technology. We've written about it. I've read about it endlessly and I, and I still find it pretty confusing. So he's looking to duct his heat pump that's heating his water so that it can act as an air conditioning for his upstairs or dehumidification? Dehumidifying. Dehumidification yeah. upstairs. 
Um, so some of the heat pump water heaters have this capability. I recently saw one on John Beer's house. He's mm -hmm. building a house, the current fine home building home. Uh, and uh, he has an A.O. Smith unit, and it has a duct kit. And it's got, I think, a six-inch uh, poured on it to send the dehumidified air wherever you want. And he has a strategy. He's actually going to divert it depending on the season because sometimes you want that warm dehumidified air coming upstairs. Sometimes you don't want warm air coming upstairs. So uh, he's got a strategy that deals with it seasonally. And uh, A.O. Smith could probably help you out, Ed. Have you guys heard of this capability? Yeah, I no. no, I have not. I thought he and was I, making it up. I'm glad it's a, it's a feature that's a part of these products. Yeah. It's the one, it's a kind of, I, I have, so I have two water heaters, one for this side and one for the mother-in-law side. And I, that is probably a regret that I, I wish I would have gone and the, and the kind of the consultants for the electric company was really pushing me to get a, a, a heat pump water heater. And, you know, at that point I was just bleeding money. <laughs> so I was just that extra 1500 or 2000 bucks. It just was a killer, but I do regret not doing that. And, it, and who knows, maybe that would have helped with my moisture problem because hers is on the, in the, I bet space. it would have Mark. I, I so absolutely I, bet. It and would you know, have. if that's the case, if I have to, and it would just, ugh, that would pay me to do it. But if we determine that it just needs dehumidification and I can accomplish that with a peat pump water heater, I'll just, I'll use, you know what, I could, I could move that one over to my shop, I guess, and get it. That's what I was just going to say. That's your domestic hot water for your shop. Yeah. I'll have to investigate. That's great. See, I'm, see, I'm supposed to be, uh, am I supposed to be learning that much on this? Should I be contributing yeah. more than I learn? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for the after show. Right. <laughs> What do you think I work here for? No, that was right, exactly. Like, oh, why? Why are you God. here again? What's? What are you contributing? <laughs> okay, what's the next question that I have no idea about, Patrick? Well, I was just going to say <laughs> that I made the same mistake, Mark. I put a resistance uh, heat, heat water heater in my basement for the same reason you did. It's just like it was a huge chunk of change to upgrade two grand mm -hmm. versus like five hundred, six hundred. Yep. Uh, and, and the two grand is for the cheapest of the options. I think that ducted A.O. Smith unit I was just talking about is more than that. But Connecticut, I don't know if other states have it. At least New York does because John Beer got the same rebate. It's a thousand bucks, just like Ed mentions here. So um, that's a lot. Yeah, right? that is a would lot. That have, oh, absolutely. Would that have been an, enough to sway you, Mark? It, yeah. Absolutely. Because I would have put in, in the units that I was looking at, that would have put it right in line. I mean, it would have made it just maybe even less than a couple hundred dollar difference. So yeah, that absolutely would have made a difference. I'm thinking of getting one now too, but I, yeah, I'm going to, one of my personality flaws is I am so unwhelling to fix something that's not broke. Uh, <laughs> yeah. what, you know, like why would I invest the Saturday to make a mess in the basement, have a potentially, uh, the water heater not work, right? Yeah. Cause sometimes the ones out of the box don't work and I just, yep. A way to it fails and, and it's, deal with even it if it's yeah it's just it's working well enough right now <laughs> you know it's just it's yeah there again it's, i think it's human nature why mess with something that's not completely broken <laughs> jeff do you have a heat pump water heater have you considered it i have considered it because i mine's actually an oil fired one and it's old well it's 20 years old so you know it's like it's gonna die someday and so I have thought about it. So your, uh, one your, of the obstacles uh, with switching technologies I hear from uh, service plumbers and HVAC techs is that they just put what's there existing. So if you yeah. if you get to the point where you are you don't have hot water, my suspicion is you're going to be tempted to just put another oil-fired unit in there. Is that true? Certainly there's a tendency to do that. I mean, because, you know, to get, to get a... Uh, a heat pump water heater in there i'd have to get some wiring done and like right now my electrical box is full so yeah yeah you have to get another so i think some of the incentives include uh upgrades to electrical services to uh, to account for some of the uh, electrification that our country is trying to get done right isn't the uh, inflation reduction act include uh, electrical upgrades as part of the incentives as i understand it Oh, I don't know, but now I want to look more in detail. Yeah, I want to get some of that cash before it dries up. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have a pretty new tankless water heater, so it has one of those like very small-looking boilers. Is it gas-fired, Sam? 
gas fire. Yeah. yeah, but you can have those as electric or gas, right? I was trying to remember before. Well, the I electric said. ones are pretty impractical because they take like absolutely yeah. and then banana amount electric, of electrons. Dude, yeah. yeah. How so. do you like that tankless? I think it's great. I, I moved in and it was brand new, so I was just so glad to move in somewhere where there was like a new system because I had offered previously on a house, we had this discussion before where the inspection just made me realize like, you know, this, this tank could go at any moment, this boiler right. could go at any moment, this could be, you know, thousands of dollars of work at any moment. So then I knew what to look for these new upgraded systems of some efficiency. So seeing yeah. this type of water heater, we had just written an article by Scott Gibson on the most efficient water heaters. And we talked about the heat pump ones and the tankless versions. And so um, yeah, I, I was, uh, still living with my parents when they transitioned to a, to a tankless water heater from their old version. And it was much better and it, it lasts, the water lasts, the hot water. Oh, it's endless longer. is how yeah. it's described. Yeah. Yeah. I had an old water heater talking about not fixing something that's not broken or fixing something that's not my at my last house it was built in 85 and the water when i moved in you know 15 17, 16 years after it was built and the water heater already looked it was a propane fire gas fired and it already looked like it was dying and i know Ooh. the thing was and we had such terrible well water and they, the the person before me never had a, a house filter so this thing was rusty and gross and and but it works so well. I mean, we'd have people. It was an old ream, and we'd have people. You know, six showers in the morning, and it just it always worked. That's but I funny. knew it was efficient, inefficient. But it's just one of those things where it's like this thing's. You know, I wouldn't have felt bad that it died, but I'm like kept waiting for it to die, and it never did. I was it was 45 years old by the time I moved out. The thing is, the gas ones makes water so quickly. Like when people say they have a, you know. 60 gallon gas water tank i'm just like like why it just, yeah. just what are you doing with it filling a hot tub every day yeah. <laughs> my uh the last resistance tank i had you were talking about water quality and how that affects the insides of there when i when i, I just for curiosity pulled out the the elements so i could peek in there and i swear there was like four inches of what looked yeah. like sand or uh, crust in the bottom of that thing doesn't seem good. How often do you check those? Every year? Or? Ever? Ever? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't, isn't that something? I would so recommend to, checking again. <laughs> so they, I mean, because you're not, I'm just, I mean, isn't that kind of a home maintenance? Because, yeah, it's been you're 20 years. You're supposed to flush them. D do you flush your water tank? I flush my old ones, yeah, once, probably at least once a year for sure. Really? Yeah. Well, That's this funny. thing was full filled with rust and garbage and nastiness that yeah you, it was you're making me feel bad and feeling <laughs> inadequate no i did it every year but it was gas so i know that you have the the oh what are they called the little elements there's an anode for it but yeah anodes. yep the anodes i thought you're supposed to kind of inspect those every once in a while jeff do you inspect yours i have oh, you had you had oil don't yeah. you that's right we actually had ours replaced in an apartment we lived in once because our hot water was coming out like slightly yellow and it had something to do with that. It was dissolving the sacrificial anode and or yeah. the wire that was remaining. And yeah. that's when we had the person, um, the technician come and they, I said like, oh, when I was filling up with hot water, like to cook something. And he said, never cook with hot water. And I didn't know that. I didn't ask more questions, but it probably has something to do with the elements used to like heat the water. So I always like use cold water and heat it up now. Really? Cook. I've never heard that before. I've heard that too, but it was in places where lead was a concern. I don't know if that's a concern oh. everywhere. I think this had to do with the problem that I had experienced where it was like, uh. you, you don't know if something's going wrong. Like it's going to huh. affect the hot water and not the cold water, I guess. I, I always use, if I'm boiling water, I'm starting with hot water. It just makes it quicker. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that you should stop, but now that I've been told, I'm going to have to research that now. Thanks for that. Rabbit. Thanks for that. Last, am I right? <laughs> Thanks for that rabbit hole. <laughs> so Samantha, you are supposed to service those on-demand gas uh, water heaters with some regularity. So have you have you had to do that? What did it cost? So I like? did it. Um, we moved in in 2020, and I did it before the winter of 2021. And the person came and did like some scraping out of some different filters and 
said a bunch of weird things that I did not think were very correct and then told me that I should do that every two years, but do my air conditioning every year. And I, I haven't called anybody since to do anything in my home, which is terrible, I'm sure. But I think I need to understand a little bit more. So exactly. the risk is like when you have this ginormous burner, right, you're going to get uh, mineral buildup in it in the heat exchanger, right? So you need to descale it every once in a while so it works efficiently and doesn't get plugged up from that minerals. Sense. And that's yeah. what he was doing with the scraping. And he, I actually could do it myself. Like I saw what he did, although I would call someone because I wouldn't want to get something wrong. But my concern was bleeding the system. I thought I needed to bleed the system every year. And so I called this person to do that because I have old like cast iron radiators um, but turns out he was like, no, that's not something that you generally will ever need to do. So I don't know if that's correct either. I'm going to call a different company for this next year. <laughs> yeah. You know, combustion appliances should be serviced to clean out their heat exchangers because, uh, you know, they work better when they're clean and if they get too dirty, they don't work at all. <sighs> it was a hundred bucks, something like that. And th I would imagine it's yeah, that much more important on an on-demand system like that. Yeah. Just the amount of heat and the amount of surface area just is They important. have ginormous burners, like 100,000 yeah. BTU burners to make right. that, you know, water in any 40 little, to little build 90 up, degrees or 100 degrees. Yeah, any little buildup, you think your efficiency would drop really fast. Well, if any of you are all on the fence to stay tuned for the after show, I'm going to give you a little taste of what we're going to talk about. I came up with a little list of things that I wanted to discuss and uh, setting compounds versus drying type uh, joint compounds lightweight versus all purpose and taping compounds, uh, drywall lifts and other tools to make this uh, sometimes onerous work easier. And I have my 10 tips for finishing, which you're gonna have to stay tuned to hear because it is gonna be worth I the price of admission, I promise. I'm ready. I have my I personally notes. can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> the home and then, right actually now. that sounded like sarcasm but it really wasn't <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of that in this show mark right. <laughs> well if you all are access all access members thank you very much for your support if you're not i hope you'll consider it but in any case thank you very much for listening everybody it has been a pleasure spending time with you uh thanks to samantha mark and jeff for joining me and please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. So part of my own vanity is to check the iTunes podcast server uh, with some regularity. And I think the Fine Home Building podcast is up to a 4.8 rating. And I don't know if you can get to five, but my dream would be that there is a five. So uh, if you all would help us out, I'd really be grateful. Leave a comment how you like the show or don't and uh, it helps other folks find it. So stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Stay tuned for drywall. <laughs> <laughs>